Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Welcome back to Sand, the Sand Arts Visiting Practitioner Series. Nice to see so many of you still here. I'm very pleased to welcome this week um, Nzinga Sounds. So we have DJs Ade and Juni Rankin. Uh, their real names are June Reed and Linda Rosenwa Patton. I hope I got that right. So they're going to um, tell us a bit about Nazinga Sounds for about an hour and 15 minutes, and then we've got some time for questions, as usual. So I'll just briefly introduce you both. Nazinga Sounds, established in the early 80s, is now one of the UK's longest-running all-women sound systems. Their music selection is wide-ranging, spanning reggae, soul, rare groove, calypso soca, and incorporating African, Latin, and jazz. The sound is played at various London venues, including Charing Cross and Kentish Town Forum, as well as across the UK and internationally, in the Gambia, Barbados, and Sierra Leone. From the late 80s, they launched and hosted the popular Sunday afternoon uh, community radio show on sophisticated London radio, and have featured interviews with reggae artists such as Ziggy Marley, Augustus Pablo, and Betty Wright. And this year, they've also played festivals such as the um, Paris Londres uh, Music Migrations and Radiate. So please join me in welcoming Nzinga Sounds. <laughs> First of all, one, two. Mic check. Mic check. Just wanted to thank you all for coming along and um, being part of this session with us. We really feel honoured. Yes, it really is a pleasure to be here. Um, and um, when we get to the question and answer um, section of um, the event, we hope that you know we'll be able to answer as many of your questions as possible, but also get an idea of um, some of the work that you're involved in. So to kick off, I think we better start with a definition of what a sound system is. So um, basically, sound systems came out of Jamaica in the uh, 40s and 50s. So previous to that, if you were sort of middle upper class, it was lots of live music and, and orchestras. But following um, the Second World War, a lot of people left the Jamaica and went abroad. So that meant um, people had to find other ways of um, enjoying music. So people had the idea of having a turntable, and what they then did was to hook that up to uh, a PA system, and that's how it started. But in brief, um, a sound system will consist primarily of a deck or two decks. Joshaka, who's a leading dub artist for over 30 years, plays his one deck, but most people have two decks. They then have a mixer, an amplifier, and um, a series of speakers, and they can vary from being quite compact now to, you know, um, having them separate as a trebles, mid, and bass. Has anybody here been to Carnival? Great. So most of you will have checked out and sort of stood by a sound system. Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically that's what a sound system is, and it's, kind of, it's mobile, it'll go from playing outdoor venues as well as playing at parties, weddings, um, um, sound system clashes where one or more sound systems will play against each other and the one who the audience judged to play the best music is the winner. And it's predominantly male. Yeah. Yes, and uh, as Linda was just prompting me, it's very much a male environment. Um, even today, it's I would, I would say we would say 90% of sound systems are owned and run by men. And even if you look at flyers for events, you'll see that either the whole um, sound system or DJ listed are men, and occasionally you'll see the odd woman, but predominantly it's male, as Linda yeah. said. And just to add to what June said, that um, I think an important part of sounds in the UK is that there really are an advent that is born out of the creativity of um, mostly African Caribbean people that were here that found themselves in the UK and often the mainstream um, modes of entertainment were ex they were excluded from so it was about being imaginative in terms of setting up their own modes of entertainment so you'd find that sounds would play as June said at dances house parties blues parties and it's a testament also to the engineering genius of some of the engineers the early engineers because as June said in those days they would literally build the boxes from scratch 
and often times when we were school, we'd go in um, to assembly and the tannoys would be missing, only to find that the tannoys most times have been liberated and used for this to set up sounds. So it was a testament to really using what they had to build um, quite sophisticated sound equipment for these dances. And, and Linda's totally right. Um, so traditional clubs back in the 50s and the 60s weren't available to black people, African Caribbean people, so people would make, free up a room in their house, empty out the furniture, bring in the speakers, bring in all the equipment, and they'd have what they call a blues dance, or what some of you might have heard of as a shabine, where people would bring in drinks and food and sell, but also there'd be music playing, and they would happen once a week, whether it be Brixton, whether it be Clapham, whether it be North London, all over London, because that's the only way that black people could come and hear their own music. And it would be Jamaican records that would be brought over by individuals or imported, and that was a way in which... Um, you know, the people could hear their own music that they'd left behind in Jamaica. So a lot of artists, such as like um, um, Gregory Isaacs and um, um, Toots. Toots and the Maytals, mm -hmm. all artists like their, like those, that's how their music got, got brought over into this country until a couple of labels were established in Britain and then Im imported and people bought from those labels. Um, I think just a... Um, it's also important to add that in those early days, um, like a lot of migrants, they they were influenced a lot by American music, and so not only the indigenous indigenous music from Jamaica, but also a lot of the jazz artists, blues artists from America were very popular. So we'll probably revisit this, but um, I think we can move on to the definition of Nzinga sound. So Nzinga um, was chosen really because we believed it reflect aspects of our reality as being black African women in the UK. And Nzinga was a 16th century Angolan warrior queen that thwarted um, a lot of the incursions by the British army. So for us, she represented determination, resilience, tactical thinking, strategic thinking, and a lot of the things that we were up against as young women growing up in the UK. So that's where Nzinga sounds comes from. So I'll move on to the next slide. So uh, this slide goes back a little way. A long to time. Long time. <laughs> um, probably to the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, so the slide on, um, my, um, on my left is us at secondary school in uh, Norwood. And basically, that's where Linda and I met. We met at 11 and we've known each other ever since. And what we've got um, is that I'm deputy head girl and the other young lady on the left is head girl. And we've got a VIP called Dr. Wint. And Linda's going to remind me, he was an athlete, a Jamaican athlete. Okay. And he'd come to visit our school, which was had predominantly um, Jamaican um, girls. But, for, you know, there was English girls there, um, girls from um, the uh, continent, but predominantly Jamaican. So there's lots of links fostered with Jamaicans. Mm. And the significance about Dr. Wint is that he was a medical... Um, specialist. He was a medically trained doctor, but also an Olympic champion and also the High Commission to the UK at that time. So for us, it was a big deal. We went to a school called Nord Girls School in West London, prob sorry, in South London, South West London, probably one of the toughest schools at that time. And so it was a big deal for us to sort of host one of the few visits to the UK by such a distinguished person. And um, yeah, June in her capacity as deputy head was and being Jamaican was kind of really honoured to, you know, present him to the rest of the school. And the picture on my right is really a party at Linda's house, um, and as, as the slide says, it's the beginning. So Linda's comes from a, a big family, five children, and um, the, the family were originally from Sierra Leone. Very, very sociable family. Lots of very um, inviting neighbours and other family members, and it'd be lots of social um, events at their house. At their house. So that's us trying to get down, probably to James Brown, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but the the importance of that picture is really going back to how we had to make our own entertainment. And um, how we did that was um, having our, our own gatherings. But then this is the beginning of how, where the sound are, I suppose the beginnings of playing out and being used to playing in public domains where this came from. So this would be a family party. And in those days, 
there was a very strict um, code of conduct, I suppose you could say, that the, there was, in most households, there was the front room and there was the back room. And the front room was really like a showpiece room that was only for the domain of visitors most of the time. And the back room is where the most was the family room where most of us spent our time. So this was really at the front room, probably one of the few times we were allowed in the front room. And the front room is where most of the dancing and the socializing took place. And the only reason I got into playing music at much younger age than this was because I'd make myself useful by volunteering to play the music. And that gave me um, agency to be in a place with big people, which generally we came from a, a the generation of being seen and not heard, especially as women. So that gave me kind of the reason to be in that space. So that's why that picture is very important. And then we fast forward to the um, slide on the um, on my right. Next one. Yep, that's right. Thanks, Linda. Where now we've um, bought our own equipment. We've decided that we're getting a lot of requests to play. And rather than borrowing and hiring equipment, we're going to have our own equipment. So um, as you can see, it's at that stage, it's predominantly vinyl, because that's where, where, we, where our background was. Um, and we've got our two decks, which are technique decks, which we've got to the, to, to, till today. And um, we've also got our mixer. And um, do, you, do you want me to touch on Virgin at this stage? So I was going to say that the, the, we date this really about 20 odd years ago, um, at least. We kind of like lose track of time, you know. It's kind of one of the things that um, we, we sometimes marvel the length of time that we've been doing this. And people talk about us retiring, but we're nowhere near retiring. In, in many ways, we're just getting started to the next chapter. So, but this was at least 20 years ago. And as June says, that equipment is still in pristine condition because, you know, um, for us, it was important as women to have control of the equipment, to be able to set up the equipment, to be able to walk into a space and to take charge, even when sometimes when we weren't sure, because um, it depends on when you walk into a, a venue, it could be someone's flat, it could be a concert hall, it could be a church hall. You have to you know, navigate the room and be able to make your equipment work in any space. And for women, we had to sometimes fake it till we made it, you know, because sometimes, we, it's, it, as June says, said earlier, it is a, a predominantly male domain. But yes, we should talk about prior to this virgin, as, because that, again, is the important juncture in our careers. So basically, um, Virgin Records was um, located um, the Tottenham Court Road end of Oxford Street. It's now Primarney. Um, but basically, it was a, a, a massive, it was called the Mega Store, so it's one of the biggest record shops in, in, in London at the time. Um, I started working there in 81, having finished Polytechnic, so it shows you pre-university days. And basically, I just wanted, I loved music, I just wanted a job, so I persuaded the manager to um, to employ me. So I was, I was the first black person to work there that wasn't a cleaner and it wasn't a security guard. And shortly thereafter, um, then an opportunity came up and Linda got the a job there as a, a buyer. Um, I think it's important that Linda talks a little bit about that because she made some serious inroads into... Um, the, the buying at Virgin. Right, so again, being just out of uni, um, maybe a bit older than you all are, um, our first post-uni job, and really at a time of high unemployment, this, these are the Thatcher years, these are the, the years of austerity, of a lot of political unrest, minor strikes, there was a lot of, in terms of the black community, there was a lot going on in terms of our um, wanting to have, trying to have a voice and trying to, um, fight against what we, which were a lot of uh, injustices, really. There was a lot of de deaths in police custody. There was um, the, stop and search. Stop, the sus laws, the stop and search. There was also important cases, landmark cases, that preceded the Stephen Lawrence case, um, such as the New Cross fire, which um, basically um, was a house party of teenagers having a good time on a Saturday night, it was firebombed and 13 young people were, were killed. And up till now, no one has really been brought to account. So this was the time that when we were, you know, embarking on our first kind of jobs, really. Um, yeah, did you want to? Did you just want to say a bit about your role at Virgin? Right, sorry. So in terms of, yeah, again, it's only now, years later, we kind of like realize the significance of some of the things that we've contributed to the whole kind of landscape of sound system, culture, and music in this country. So Virgin Megastore, the biggest music outlet on Oxford Street, I think second 
ahead of Tower Records at that time and HMV and another record shop called Our Price Records. So we were the first black employers there in kind of like a in that kind of capacity and had the freedom to really make an impact. So I was a buyer for the reggae, soca, African and world music sections. And simply because I had a passion for music. I mean, I wasn't setting up to make any big statements. I just knew good music um, and had a passion for it. But as a result of that input, we established supplier lines with Virgin for companies that would never have had that option, you know, to supply a shop like Virgin. And the main thing to say, which Linda skipped over, is that she actually established the first African record section in a mainstream shop. So it was a major, major thing. And a lot of um, African artists got exposed through having their record shops uh, stocked in that shop at the time. And again, part of the landscape politically was, you know, this was the time of apartheid. This is pre Nelson Mandela's release, Steve Biko, and other kind of people that were fighting for freedom within um, South Africa. And so the picture on the right kind of shows the transition over the last 20 plus years, as Linda was saying. So from us sort of in our early days there to playing at um, the Radiate, sorry, the um, Paris Londres Festival, which was in, in Paris. Um, and I'll get Linda to say a little bit about that because it accompanied a major exhibition, which is on until January next year. Right. So the Paris Londres Immigré exhibition was an exhibition that was looking at um, the music migrations of communities in Paris and London between the years of 1962 and 1989, specifically looking at uh, those communities in Paris, such as the Algerian community, um, the Moroccan community, and obviously the indigenous, um, sorry, and African francophone countries who came to Paris um, and looking at that as a comparison to what was happening happening in London. So we were asked, and it was a big privilege for us to be asked by Sussex University to be part of that. Um, and we were the, I suppose, the, we were the in-house DJs that day, and we played for seven hours straight, which, again, we weren't expecting, but, again, it was something that, for us, was a massive opportunity because um, it very much was almost like a journey through history and time, looking at some of the musics that we've been playing um, within a different setting. So, do you want to take that one? So we've said a little bit about who we are, are and how we got established. We've said a little bit about our backgrounds. So over the last 30 odd years, um, we've built up a lot of knowledge in terms of music. So we both worked at the record shop, as, as we've said. So we had a lot of opportunity to play new music as it was coming in and to be exposed to music from a wide uh, range of genres. Um, we've also had to learn ourselves, teach ourselves how to set up the equipment, as Linda said earlier, in very, very varied spaces. And when we've had a technical hitch, had to try and work out how, you know, once the music's gone down, what's happened, to look as though we know what we're doing, and to try and get the music up, up and running as quickly as possible. Um, our drivers, it's really, really um, important for us to share the love and passion for our music. And one of the things we've tried to do is to not just play reggae and soul, but to introduce people to Latin music, to introduce people to music from around the continent. Um, and just to expose people to a, a greater variety of artists. Yeah, and I would just add to that in terms of, again, I think, it's in, I think it's important to say that we didn't set out to be you know, champions of women within sound system culture. It was something that we got into through a particular set of circumstances, historical, cultural, and societal. And so for us, it was you know, following our passion. You know, it was about um, giving agency to a marginalized community or marginalized communities in the UK by way of music, bringing people together under kind of like the kind of like the things that united us against what we were fighting against as a force of oppression. So whilst these sound like quite big, lofty um, challenges, these, this was a reality for us. And as women being in that space, when you mention something like a technical hitch, that's a big deal. Number one, when you walk into a space generally, they're not expecting you to know much about, you know, as say it's a traditionally male-dominated space. They're not expecting women to generally know what they're, they're they're doing and then be to be any good. So we were always pushing ourselves and challenging ourselves and through that we were able to grow. And I think it's a testament that 
over 35 years later, we're still doing it. And that's because, you know, we know what we're talking about. And the other thing to pick up is you'll see here we're playing CDs. So, you know, as CDs came on the scene, a lot of times you couldn't get a particular track on vinyl. And I was kind of dragged kicking and screaming to buy, um, to buy, to buy CDs. So one of the things we've had to do is to move with the times. And, you know, we did a gig a couple of weeks ago now where we had our own um, speaker box that was like a busker box. And I used Spotify and we Bluetoothed. So we've tried to keep up with the times and play according to the needs of the venue and the needs of the event. Yeah. And on that note about the needs of the event, I think that's one of the things that we've found is... Because we're not alone. There are other women. There's a whole kind of hidden history of women within sound system culture. And we're, we sit alongside some of the pioneer women who came before us and really paved the way. And we'll sort of touch on that a bit later. But, you know, certainly for us, you know, it's, um, it's, it has been a privilege to be able to do something that we love and to get paid for it and to work in different locations. So we've um, had the for good fortune to play in, in, in the Caribbean, in Barbados, in the Gambia. And um, I played in Sierra Leone last year. June was in Naples earlier this year. So, you know, it's taken us places to different communities. But the key thing and the golden thread that runs throughout all of this is that music really is a force for unification and bringing communities together. So moving on. So we said a little bit about why, why we play. It's really the love of the music. And there's nothing nicer than going to a space that you haven't been before and maybe playing to some people that you know because people know us over the last 30 years and they will come to events. But also a lot of times we don't know the people. And it's really, really pleasurable to see people who really enjoy themselves at the end of the evening and come and say thanks and how they've enjoyed us themselves and us where we're playing again. Um, we've given you a flavour of the of the venue. So this is us at the Parilondra. No, sorry, is that right, Linda? No. This this image is of the Notting Hill Notting Carnival Hill. Pioneers Festival. And the significance of this festival is that um, in my day job, I act as a consultant. And for the last six years, I've worked with a local community, um, which basically lies in the shadow of Grenfell, um, and developed this festival in 2013. Um, and over the years, it's grown from a very small festival that was on a literally a, a green, maybe a couple of hundred people, to this size now, 4,000 strong. And in 2017, in August, because the festival happens in the lead up to Carnival, in 2017, it was the first community festival after the Grenfell tragedy, and it was a massive challenge as to whether we would go ahead with it or whether, you know, kind of out of deference to the families and the victims, that we wouldn't. But it very much, there was an overwhelming passion in the local community to definitely go ahead with it. And it's been part of, you know, I suppose the healing process in the sense that it's something that the community feel that they have ownership of. They've watched it grow. They've made it a success. And it was a real privilege to really kind of like play a significant role in establishing it. So we played last year, this is last year, 2018, and we played alongside one of the greats of the reggae sound system, um, World the Cox and Dodds. Do you want to speak Lord Coxon. So Lloyd, Lloyd Coxon, sorry. Yeah, Lloyd Coxon came here as a young man in the, um, in the 50s or 60s, and he's one of the leading um, uh, reggae sound systems. Anybody who um, knows about sound systems will, will know about him. He's a pioneer. So when he came here, he um, set up his sound system, was part of um, you know, drawing on records that were being imported in the, in, in the 60s, and he's, he's, he's a legend. He plays all over the country as well as abroad. Um, and a lot of um, uh, younger sound systems, such as Saxon sound system and other sound systems, they were what we call box boys. They used to carry the record boxes for sounds like Lloyd Coxon. So a lot of people did their kind of internship, one would say, yeah. by on big sounds like Sir Lloyd, Sir Lloyd Coxon. And the, the important thing for us was that we've had the privilege of playing with him a couple of times. And um, by the end of the session, he is really... Um, um, giving us recognition. Yeah, acknowledgement and recognition, which again is not often something you get from your male counterparts. We've had a lot of support along the way, and which we'll touch on from other um, sound systems and other men who've given us breaks. But it's just really gratifying um, when you, you kind of like get a nod from someone who, who really doesn't need to. He doesn't need to play with us, he doesn't need to give us space, and he's often wanting us to, you know, to do collaborative work. So, you know, it's clear that we're you know, that as women that we, we do represent. Um, just touching on some of the other kind of audiences that we play to, this is just kind of like a collection going back 
quite a few years, um, but it just gives us a sense of the different audiences that we play to. We can play to either christenings, naming ceremonies, weddings. Um, a lot back in the day, a lot of the publicity was kind of like do it yourself, as you can see, this Afro man swan in the center, kind of, that was, you know, literally someone doing a freehand drawing and um, photocopying it. But oftentimes we would have the privilege of playing with big artists. Um, Jim will maybe talk about Burning Spear and Heptones, but on the left-hand side, Baba Ma was probably one of the leading African artists of the, the 80s and 90s. Yeah, originally from Senegal. So Burning Spear was a big deal for us because um, he's a roots reggae artist. Some of you might have come across him. And he and he's a legend. And we were lucky in the early 90s to be asked to play the music in the intervals and in the run up to him coming on stage. So that was a, a, a massive deal. Um, the forum, which is well, the venue, which is now called the Forum in Kentish Town, but it used to be the Town and Country Club. Again, this, you know, this all predates a lot of you, but you know, probably a capacity of four or 5,000 people. And to have us as women DJs back in the 90s playing, it was a great, a great honor. Also, as Linda said, top left is the Heptones. The Heptones, another major reggae, uh, Jamaican-based reggae group from the 60s and the 70s. We had the honor, honor of playing um, alongside them in North London in the Selby, at the Selby Center. So as Linda said, we've had a variety of um, uh, venues and spaces that we've played in. And as we've touched on earlier, some of the events being outdoors and being, and being abroad. So moving, so moving on to um, kind of the actual space, you know, it is a very, um, whilst to the uninitiated, walking into a dance space or a, a blues party, it looks um, very unstructured. It very much is a codified space in the sense that there are roles and roles, set roles that people occupy, whether you're the boxman that June referred to, that, that everything, rel everything relies on them. Nothing's going to happen unless the sound is right. So you have the box men, you have the DJs, you have the MCs, you have the adherents who are the people who are coming to the dance, um, and you have people who may be kind of supporting, maybe doing the catering. But it's almost like a micro economy, and it has to run correctly. You also would have the engineer, and the engineers or engineer would be really, really important because people are looking for a certain sound quality. They know what they're looking for, so the the sound has to be crisp. Um, and is, as Linda was saying, it's a very technical and specialised role. Again, so you'd have the person on the mic who would be um, warming up the crowd, maybe chatting some lyrics. You'd have the selector who would select the tracks um, and the person who would actually play the tracks. So as Linda said, it's a whole team effort right from start to finish and you'd have to earn your ability to, to occupy any of those roles. It's normally just the two of us, so we kind of are flexible and we will go in between any of those roles. What our preference is, is to let the music play. We're not people who want to chat over the music. People come to hear the music and they come to hear the lyrics. So we're much more around introducing ourselves, saying a little bit, but wanting people to enjoy the, the, the track that they're, they're listening to. But I'm um, also in terms of mic etiquette. And, you know, it, it is a massive challenge when you think about, as women, you know, you'd walk into the space. And as I said before, it generally is the codified space where people know their, their place and they know their, you know, literally their, their place within that, um, you know, dance gathering. But two women often walking into a space with boxes, equipment, and setting up often has a very disruptive effect. People feel destabilised because they're not used to it. And so these are the challenges that we've often have to... That puts an extra pressure on us that we have to deliver and deliver big because, you know, people are very unforgiving. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen... Uh, the American stage um, show called the Apollo Theatre, where people literally get stoned and booed off the stage. It often is like that. You know, you literally are going into um, battle in a way. And as Linda said, it is very unforgiving, particularly for women, because the, the people start off with, often with a low expectation. Um, so we've had questions like, um, so we'll have our box of records where we can help ourselves and select from. People say, well, whose music is that? Because it clearly can't be yours. There might be a clue that we've got the... You know, the, the microphones, microphone, the microphone, etc. So that's why we've kind of like said, where's the DJ? Because that's been a reoccurring question that we've faced, you know, 30 odd years ago and up till maybe last year. Absolutely. They'll look you right in the eye and say, oh, yeah, so, so where's the DJ? When, when's the DJ turning up? Or they'll come over without asking you, they'll start to look through your record box 
um, and just think how rude, or they'll see the microphone because we've laid it down and they want to take it up and start nicing up the dance as far as they're concerned. So you know the volume, microphone volume goes down, mm -hmm. as far as we're concerned, if we want to chat on the mic, we want someone to, we'll invite them. Or um, back in the early days, we used to have a, a, a dear friend of ours who used to come out and help us, and they would walk past us, as Linda said, with, our, with the CD or the vinyl in our hand, headphone on, whatever, and ask him to play, could he play a particular track, or what was the track being played? Because clearly, mm. they can't see they can't see us, because you know we're, we're challenging the status quo. Mm. And just one thing to add, that in terms of the skills, that we've never kind of like sat down and, and kind of until recently reflected on the kind the kind of skills you need to be an effective DJ. So when you think that you'd be in a dance space, maybe with a you know, a normal dance be a couple of hundred, a concert would be several thousand, and the pressure is on, usually these spaces are poorly lit, if pitch black. So you have to walk with your own light source. And in within that space you have to be able to cue a record track and play and keep the crowd going. So these are kind of the some of the technical um, and physical kind of challenges that we're, we're having to deal with. Shall we move on to the next slide? Which really is about what we referred to earlier on. This gives a bit of a reflection of the political climate of when we were about formative years. Um, the middle magazine, Black Arts in London, was again a self-help magazine that the black community put out uh, purely to um, keep a record of things that we felt were important to the black community, merely because it wasn't being reflected in other mainstream newspapers. It's again a kind of testament to the creativity of the black community and resilience in a way. The Nubian Tales magazine was again a magazine that was about developing audiences specifically around um, very talented black filmmakers that were not getting recognition or opportunities to exhibit their films. And that was, um, Nubian Tales was an organization that I worked for that screened films out of the Prince Charles Cinema in Leicester Square. And on that occasion, we worked on Spike Lee's Malcolm X um, film. The middle picture is showing a very young Spike Lee, and that was in August 1988. And that picture was um, part of uh, a workshop that was hosted by Cheddo Film and Video Shop, Video Workshop, which Jim will talk about. So um, Spike brought out his first film, She's Got to Have It, and um, there was a low expectation of the film, so we managed to book the film and, and screen it. But uh, the distributors didn't want us to have it because near the, near the time for it to be um, launched, they realised it was going to be a big, big film. And actually uh, having um, us paid for the, to, to have it, they were trying not to let us have it. But anyway, we managed to kind of bully them into letting us have it. And the place in Tottenham, we had a sort of community space in Tottenham was 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 ran basically um, and we invited Spike and he came over and he spoke about the film and um, he did a Q&A session which was which was amazing. Yeah, so this this um, edition, I'd written an article about that event. Um, now, I was a very young, you know, I wasn't a qualified writer, but I thought it was such a momentous occasion to have someone like Spike Lee come into the black community and give a lot of his time, because he was there for a number of hours, talking with, you know, young filmmakers, um, young artists, about the importance of, you know, being in control of your own narrative. Um, one of the key things I'll never forget that he said at that session was that no matter how small your budget is, from a technical point of view, make sure that you have the best equipment that you have or that you have that the sound is the best that it can be, that the, the, the visuals are the best that they can be. Whether or not you, you, you get favours from people, you know, do not scrimp when it comes to the technical side of things. And he also said that it's incumbent on the, um, the black community in the UK to take control and that the most important thing was to having control of the messages that went out that spoke on our behalf. Because if you don't, you end up with things like the, the headlines about Carnival, um, which again has, has caught such a bad press um, in terms of you know, how it's portrayed in the media. When we, when we know as being people who've been to Carnival over the years, that it's, it really doesn't go like that. You know, it, it really is, as when you compare it to Glastonbury and other big festivals, they don't have near enough the same amount of crime. So still on the political theme, we mentioned earlier the New Cross massacre, which happened in 1981. Uh, 13 young people were killed in a fire. 
Um, and this was just an example of um, community response to that. The guy on the on the right hand side, the man on the microphone, somebody called Darkus Howe. He was part of a collective called the Race Today Collective and other. He was also part of the Mangrove Nine, which is a again, a kind of like a fight against injustice in West London. But it, this was typical of the type of community response to atrocities that happened on a regular basis. The other picture on the right-hand side is a newspaper clipping from a demonstration that followed the stoning to death of a poet called Mikey Smith in Jamaica because of his outspoken words in his, he, through, his, through his poetry that, that the authorities didn't like. And as a result, he met a very nasty death. And the, again, the community responded by taking to the streets outside the Jamaican embassy and demonstrating. And the guy on the mi megaphone is a very famous dub poet called Linton Kwesi Johnson. And I'm in front of him with a placard and a picture of Mikey Smith. So that's 1982. Do you want to say a bit about motherhood, Jim? So this photograph, as you can probably see, is Linda and her two, two children. And what it's representing there is that um, despite having um, other demands, so like a full-time job, um, working on a pirate station, community station, uh, which was in North London, we lived in South London, we'd drive an hour there, do a three-hour show, drive an hour back the night before, so that program was on a Sunday, the night before we might have played at a dance or a party, and then on Monday we are going back to what people might call government work. Um, so you have children, and how do you juggle it all? and really we had to try and make it work. It was about, in Linda's case, she had um, was lucky enough to have a really supportive family. So she was able to either bring the children with her, if it was a family event, or have uh, members of her family, like maybe her, her mother or her sisters, help with the childcare. But the key thing is about resilience, you know, responding to whatever our family circumstances are, and making our love of music and the passion for playing work. Um, so really, that's what that's what that's what what, that, what, what that's about. Really, um, my son, who was 21 this week, I in about the, he was born in as, um, in October, and in the August we played for my neighbour's wedding. So you know he was literally with me when we were playing out. Um, so when you know circumstances allowed, that's how we had to flex it was to draw on our family and our friends, or bring the child with you. Yeah, and this picture was taken by a, a photographer. Literally, we were in the process of hanging for an exhibition. At the time, I was an acting uh, director um, for at the Brixton Art Gallery, and having two young children and the whole, you know, process of preparing to hang a show. Um, no, you know, I didn't have the luxury of maternity leave or couldn't afford babysit. So it's about how you, as June said, how you are um, resilient but also creative in how you manage that. So the youngest one, who was always a handful, the easiest way was just to neutralize her. So strapping onto my back so I knew where she was. She was happy, didn't realise it's really a containment exercise, but it worked. Um, the, the older one, she was far more easy to, you know, um, being a bookworm, she was easier to manage. But it's something that as women, generally men don't have that challenge. It's not that they never have it, but oftentimes it's the, the childcare falls to the, to the woman. And we should also mention, um, at the time, one of... During our formative years, we worked for Obala, which was an organisation that established the first black art gallery dedicated to showing the work of black artists in the UK. And the reason why that's important or really relevant is that one of the earlier artists that, that showed at the black art gallery is a woman called Sonia Boyce, who is a professor at UAL now. Right, so um, this is about the coming out of our three or more decades of playing music, some of the things that we mm. take quite seriously. As um, women, we think we have a responsibility to encourage other people to feel en enabled, to get involved in, in sound system or DJing. Mm. Um, the other thing is to come and do talks like this so that we can share our, our, our journey and some of the um, events and activities that led up to us being part of the, this, this sound system um, 
world that we were playing in. Legacy is really important. So one of the things that we did last year was to do a vinyl workshop at the ICA. We had about six, seven people, men and women, and we were just showing them the equipment and how you actually physically play, a little bit about how what's involved in, in, in setting up. Um, and we are open to doing other workshops and, 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 and other training op op opportunities. And public speaking, we very much have been over the last three or four years speaking at venues like this, but also venues in the, in the community to encourage people who have thought about it or are dabbling at home to feel, you know, encouraged and to do create networks where um, possibly um, further workshops can be developed and they can um, harness harness their skills. Documentation is really, really important. So. Wherever we go, there's other um, our talks being videoed. We we've uh, created an archive of our flyers. We've been doing some work with the London Museum, for example. We were interviewed um, last week. Was it yeah, last week? It's part of their curating London series. And uh, we had about uh, eight or nine young people from a, a supplementary school in North London who devised their own questions, some of them very tough, actually, mm -hmm. um, where we can share our experience and, and, and our knowledge, and that can be recorded and kept in the archives of the Museum of London. And the reason why documentation is really important is that, you know, we've had, you know, over the last few years, the occasion to sort of reflect on maybe a body of work that spans almost, well, in excess of 35 years. and. It's important that as women, well, generally as practitioners, but as women in particular, that we take ownership of the contribution that we've made and also, as June's alluded to, you know, what is really going to be the legacy. There's a lot of great work that we've, that we've um, been involved in. We've made things happen at Virgin, um, as in, 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 in the sound, you know, just kind of um, promoting music, promoting, at the time of apartheid, for instance, one of the things that I was actively involved in was promoting the work of South African artists, because whilst there was a boycott on, on the irony of, of that was that it was um, curtailing the voice of those black freedom fighters. So to me, it was a no-brainer. Of course, I would be breaking the boycott. So there's a lot of work that we've done that needs documentation. And as women, it's important that we you know, stand up and be counted. Um, and yeah, it's just important. So what, if you wanted to, after today to look at a bit more about the impact of reggae music in the UK, some of the key movers, and a bit more around sound system, there is an initiative which came out of Westminster University um, that was led by Michael Riley, who used to be a member of Steel Pulse, and it's called Bass Culture. If you Google it, it will come up. Um, and basically, there's been a collection of photographs, of interviews, with a range of people from um, producers to promoters to sound system people to singers. And it's a really, really important initiative of, um, around documentation of the, the impact of the impact of reggae music in, in, in the UK. Yeah, sorry. And the reason why is that oftentimes it doesn't get documented. You know, there's so many important um, movements of music within, um, well, within the arts, whether it's music, whether it's visual art, um, you know, a couple of years ago, punk celebrated 40 years, and it was important that, you know, in terms of that important um, aspect of musical history, that was documented. But reggae music does, is not afforded the same, um, the same courtesy. So bass culture is all about exploring and really from a, an academic perspective, really, um, I suppose, monetizing the contribution that reggae has made to the UK industry, not just music, but across society. And the point about future-proofing is what I kind of touched on. It's been important for us to kind of get with the technology. So as things have moved from vinyl to CDs, CDJs, to iPads, uh, laptops, and so on, and even you know Spotify and Bluetooth thing, that we've managed to um, keep up with those trends. And as I was saying earlier, whatever the venue or the event demands, being able to be flexible and work with the different technologies. And, and also, there's always something to be um, gained from the sharing of experiences, that we come from a particular generation and that we feel that we can impart and share some of our learning with some of the up-and-coming young DJs. And likewise, you know, we can learn from their approaches as well. We'll touch on that a bit more on, the, on, the, on one of the next um, slides. But it is important in, in terms of sharing, you know, working collaboratively. Often people talk about collaborations, but they're not true. But we very much are about sharing what we've what we've um, achieved and where we can really inform, you know, the next the next generation of sound operators. So we did say that we were going to touch on um, the contribution that 
women have made and two of the key figures within that. Because in Jamaican uh, culture, there is a saying that, you know, well, in, in several cultures, that we, we stand on the shoulders of, you know, our ancestors. And very much two women who paved the way for female DJs is the ranking Miss P on the left and Sister Culture, who really were the pioneers in a completely male-dominated terrain. June, do you want to say something more? So, uh, ranking Miss P, um, she was important because her and her brother set up one of the early community stations called Dread Broadcasting at the Controls DBC, obviously a pun on BBC, mm -hmm. and um, it was quite an important community station because prior to um, that station and other stations that came out around the same time, if you wanted to hear reggae or if you wanted to hear other black music, you couldn't hear it on the mainstream, so hence the rise um, and importance of community radio. Miss P went on to um, be a DJ on Radio London and um, actually hosted and promoted a number of major reggae, reggae shows. So she was very, very important. She's got a very distinctive voice. Again, if you Google her, you might hear some clips and um, mm. get some more information about her. But she was one of the, if not the earliest, one of the earliest people in London, throughout the UK, who was a black female DJ. Sister Culture is also what we could call foundation. She had a sound system before us. Um, so we're talking about the, the late 70s, early, uh, early 80s, and you know, going and playing music and having our own equipment and playing in what is and was a predominantly male space. So we honour and pay tribute to both those sisters because they empowered and enabled people to think as two women, if you can be on the radio, mainstream radio, if you can be having your own equipment, your own sound system, and playing out in spaces that are predominantly male, you know, then maybe there's a hope or we can aspire to do that too. So moving on on that theme, what the, the, that we are not alone. There are many, many other um, women operating within this, within this space. And um, part of our kind of contribution to that was co-curating an exhibition called Sisters in Sound, A Hidden Story that featured <clears throat> 14 um, current and past DJs, presenters that have really kind of made a... a, a a significant contribution, uh, but who often go un unacknowledged. So that exhibition was part of something that June referred to earlier, which was the Base Culture Expo, which um, was, I think, shown in Marylebone earlier this year. And again, it's a, f it's a re resource that's online and urge you to, to you know, seek that out. But this is the body of work that we hope to add to and grow and have it as a digital resource going forward. So many of you will know about hopefully the uh, blue blue pack um, that the government um, run, uh, and it's part of acknowledging people who have been significant in in British British culture. So if someone if there's a building associated with someone, um, a committee decides and they will put up a, a, a blue plaque. So um, recently, sort of early on this month, there was two um, things commemorating Bob Marley as an artist, so there was a, 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 a space in West London, was it, was it, was it a studio? Yeah, a studio called the Basing Street Studio right. in, in Ladbroke Grove. So there's two spaces, one is a space where I think um, he used to frequent, and that was given a blue plaque, but the Whalers as a band were given a, a community plaque run by a, 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 a guy called um, Jack Bueller, and he has a Nubian Jack, and that's to complement and recognize black people who have made contributions to um, the UK uh, industry. And we were invited to commemorate the, um, the Nubian Jack plaque at Basing Street, where they had a sort of reception afterwards, and we, and we played a whole evening with other DJs of music that was either by the Whalers and or Bob Marley. Yeah, and again, it's one of those things that unfortunately things happen very kind of incidentally at that particular event. That we, whilst we were given the big privilege of playing at you know such a momentous event, I I was aware just through and just through local knowledge that there's a a, a, a long-standing DJ called Digital D who's been a real kind of force within her local community, and this is on her doorstep. Basing Street Studio was the site of where Bob Marley recorded and the Whalers recorded Exodus, and one of the seminal. Um, reggae albums, you know, if you haven't heard it, definitely check it out. And so, again, in the spirit of collaboration and sharing, we invited her to be part of our set, again, so that, that history reflects um, properly those who have 
made the contribution and are making contributions. So she was thrilled to be part of that. She's a local woman, you know, um, but we have to move to, from a place where things don't happen just by happenstance or by, um, by accident. It's important that, you know, things are more formalized. So hopefully we'll contribute to that going forward. So um, we talked, touched on earlier some of the things that we try and make sure happen in terms of training development and documentation and presentation, presentations. And we were invited to be part of this event that happened about, I suppose, September, mm. gosh, a few weeks ago now. And basically an organisation called Words of Colour, they put on spoken word events. But one of the things they want to explore was, as they say, forgotten women DJ pioneers. So what you have, well, there was a panel of four of us so going from someone who what well, from us who play vinyl but not totally vinyl as we said earlier right for people who play cds right for people who do usb and laptops so you had the four or five people talking about the technologies how they got into the music some of the challenges that they face as women playing playing the music as well as some of their achievements yeah and there's recording of that we'll make that available too and if people are interested in seeing the recording of that event so moving on to the next slide this really represents in the vein of kind of making our contribution this is this was an event that happened at the Jamaican High Commission where um as part of February is reggae the official reggae month in Jamaica and what they are um hoping to do going forward is to um plan a whole series of Jamaica reggae month events across the UK that can complement what's happening in in Jamaica. And this year we were invited to contribute to a Women in um, Music event and I was asked to moderate this event and sitting at the table are some really seminal women really. We have on the right hand side Janet, K sorry not Janet, Carol Thompson who's one of the queens of reggae lovers rock and in the middle we have Cameo, DJ Cameo. Um, she um, is a pioneer in producing a reggae, reggae magazine called Gargamel, and we have Sister Culture, who June mentioned earlier. So again, this is a way of us contributing, you know, our experience and sitting amongst um, and being privileged to sit, sit amongst women who are really doing great stuff in different areas of music. And this was on the occasion of Bob Marley's birthday this February, which made it even more special. So. Um we were invited to take part in an event at the British Film Institute where they were looking at carnival, so sound systems um, in, in carnival. And Lynn's going to remind me, mm. the carnival, uh, sound systems were introduced in carnival, was it in the 70s? Yeah, 1973. Um, so basically there's a, an, an important author called Lloyd Bradley. Again, look him up. He's written about four or five books on base, what he calls base culture, which is sound system as well as other aspects of reggae. And he convened this session to look at the role that sound system has played in, in, in Carnival. And um, in the pictures on the left, we've got people like Dennis Bavell, who is a major music producer. He, it's, it's said that he created the sound Lovers Rock. Um, and he's produced a number of, of, of reggae um, artists. Um, obviously there was ourselves. The young man in the kind of yellow cream outfit, he is a, 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 an amazing DJ. He's the son of Josh Shaka, I mentioned earlier. He goes under the name of Ria, um, Young Warrior and he plays around Europe and the UK, just still playing uh, similar in the tradition of his father. Um, and basically, we're just looking at, as I say, the role of sound system. There's a lot of controversy in some ways around sound system because purists will say that um, Carnival is about pan, you know, steel pan, and about costume, and there is no place for sound system. Whereas other people will say, well, sound system is what brings young people into Carnival, and there should be space for, you know, intergenerational participation um, at, at Carnival. Um, do you want to say yeah, cool. Yeah. So um, I um, am a student at Goldsmiths, and um, about six or so years ago, um, the Department of Cultural Studies established uh, an initiative called Sound System International, where they hosted seminars and had a range of speakers talking about different aspects of reggae. So this picture here is in Naples, where we had the conference back in um, yeah. April. April of, 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 of this year, where we had people from, um, 
from America, from um, Naples, where, where, where it was hosted, from Tunisia, all talking about different aspects of sound system, um, culture, but also in, including uh, topics on, on, on grime, on, on dub, on, on music as, as, a, as a business. And I'm playing at a, um, it's a, it's a squat actually, it's an amazing building, um, very cavernous, and um, that's just me playing some seven inches. But the importance again is that, um, capturing the information, you know, and elevating the whole kind of discourse about sound into the academic arena, but also enabling practitioners or semi academics to get involved, you know, because it's, it, it is a two way um, process. And I think the academic process is made all the richer by having practitioners involved in the process. And Linda, just, sorry, Linda, oh. Linda's right. I mean, we had the opening speech was by a professor. Some of you might know him, Louis Shudsuke. He's written lots of books around Afrofuturism, for example. And we also had Professor um, Sonia Stanley Naya from Jamaica, from the University of West, West Indies. So as Linda says, it's a space for academics as well as practitioners to come together look at different aspects of reggae and just um, want to take the this moment to sort of maybe show just a little clip from a video and the, the relevance of this video is that if you remember that we saw um, the slide of those um, magazines and cuttings from the 80s where Spike had come to London to talk about the importance of uh, you know controlling the image controlling the message controlling your narrative and that was 1988 so fast forward to I think literally last month and we have Spike talking about a very historic event. This is history right here. This is history, never been done before. And then look back many, many years ago and see what Tyler Perry did. This and what did Tyler Perry do? He made history all right this weekend. The grand opening of the Tyler Perry Studios. Spike Lee and a whole bunch of people were there to celebrate. Perry is the first black American to own a major film studio outright. The Atlanta Film Complex spans, listen to this, 330 acres with 12 sound stages. It's larger than the Burbank, California lots owned by Warner Brothers, Paramount, and Walt Disney Studios combined. It is ginormous. Oprah, Beyonce, Samuel L. Jackson, Spike Lee, all, wore, all walked the red carpet this weekend attending the star-studded grand opening, that's Samuel L. Jackson. We spoke to Perry in Atlanta about this historic moment. He told us why he feels ignored by Hollywood and responds to his critics. The New York Times said you are the most successful mogul Hollywood has ever ignored. Do you think Hollywood gets you? No, I clearly believe that I'm, I'm ignored in Hollywood for sure, and that's fine. I get is, it. And wait a second, is that fine? It is. My audience and the stories that I tell are African American stories specific to a certain audience, specific to a certain group of people that I know that I grew up with, and we speak a language. Hollywood doesn't necessarily speak the language. A lot of critics don't speak that language. So for, to them, it's like, what is this? But I know what I do is important. I know what I do touches millions of people around the world. I know how important every word, every joke, every laugh. I know what that does for the people where I come from and the people that I'm writing for. So, yeah, I get that. But you've also, though, been criticized in some cases by your own people, by yeah. your fellow colleagues. Were you seeking in this moment validation or that wasn't something either that you paid any attention to? You mean building all this to seek validation? No, <laughs> no, no, not at all. For me, what this is about... Or to show, listen... I know what I'm doing is what I mean. I don't, you know, if they get it, that's great. If they don't, I really feel it from the bottom of my heart. If they get it, they're great. If they don't, then that's fine too. I know for a fact that when I drive in through these gates onto this 330 acres and see these 12 sound stages and, and, and see the highway sign that says Tyler Perry Studios as you're making the exit in here, as I come in here and I see these hundreds of people working, these black and brown, I've been on sets where I've been the only black face, only black face on as recently as 2019 going where are the black people mm. in this movie is on back behind the behind the camera so when i come to work here and every black person that comes to work here they go oh my god it's heaven here we are we're represented where everybody's represented lbgtq's represented uh black white gay straight whatever we're all represented working hand in hand arm in arm so what i know about what i'm doing is any any doubters, come, just come take a visit and see, walk these streets, see these people, see these underdogs, and you tell me what I do, don't matter. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, oh, he's so the, true. It, it's right. He wants people to come and oh, see sorry. what he's done, yes. though, because it really is extraordinary. Excuse me? I mean, it's jaw-dropping. I'm going to talk about a little bit more about it at the talk. 
I'll go to the next slide. So the, m the main point that Linda was making there by showing that clip was the importance of taking control where you can of your own artistry, your own images, and believing in yourself that you can do. So as she said earlier, when we had Spike Lee talking about that in 1988 and fast forward, you know, 30 odd years, and Tyler Perry is doing it. Yeah, so um, we're gonna come to a conclusion now. And again, it, 1988, um, when, when June's, the organization that June worked for hosted Spike Lee and his producer, you know, that was ground breaking work, you know, that was pioneering work. We weren't even aware of the enormity of what we were involved in. You know, the work, the film and video workshop that June worked for at the time was part of a movement of black filmmakers, again, who were setting up their own mechanisms to make stories that told their stories, make films that told their stories. And that was, you know, really important. And Spike took the time to come and speak and inspire um, young filmmakers, you know, that they are on the right path and give them practical um, information. So fast forward, you know, that was, you know, fast forward to now, as in Zynga Sounds, DJ Ade and Junior Ranking, you know, moved from our parents' front room, playing on the old gram, and we're, we find ourselves in the summer of this year in Paris at this Paris Londres event. Um, so I think it's a good place to conclude our talk today, and we'll take some questions. But this is, um, again, just um, in terms of audiences and our ability to do what we've been doing so well for so long. This is the last um, of the seven hour stint we did in Paris in the summer. And this was the reaction Zinga Sounds was in the house. So, it's really good. Um, scene to end on because this is an example of the people they were predominantly French. So obviously whether they were French born in France or from the African diaspora, we'd never met them before. They didn't know who we were. But as Linda said, seven hours of non-stop music and they didn't want us to stop playing. And that's the beauty of the joy of when you go and you're in that space. We never take the audience for granted. Each session that we play at, we work hard to get that kind of response and it's important to us. Because people come out, you know, they give of their time. And so that was just a, an amazing experience and you know, one of many we've been lucky and privileged to have experienced. So if we urge you, if you get the opportunity to look up that link online, um, it's a fantastic um, exposition, an exhibition spanning 1962 to 89, really fascinating. And some of the things that we've shown, you know, are echoed in the exhibition. Um, we urge you to sort of, you know, just seek it out as a resource and keep an eye on, you know, forthcoming um, activations that will be part of this process. But um, yes, we've enjoyed being here today. Um, thanks for having us. Um, so the question, where's the DJ right here? Thank you so much. That was so brilliant and such an important 
education to have here in this forum. Um, I think it speaks a lot to many of the interests that our students have here in terms of challenging the canon, um, making less um, visible or less, more silenced voices heard, um, thinking about politics um, within music cultures and sound cultures. Um, so thank you so much for all of these uh, different aspects. I think um, so much of it speaks to me personally. But um, are we ready to take some questions for June and Linda? Yeah, one over here. Um, obviously, you said you were really kind of like you like to bring in the new genres of music from all around the world into England. What do you think about now? How it's so it's so much more accessible for people to like, you know, get the music from around the world, but it's still not in our kind of main culture, if you go know what I mean. So what do you kind of think about like that? What would you say? Yeah, the accessibility is interesting because um, where we uh, were on the panel, um, the Words of Colour event, um, one of the questions from a, a dub um, DJ, a woman who's a dub DJ, well, she asked the younger people on the panel where they get their music from, and there's so many different ways. You know, there's um, apparently DJ collectives where stuff's uploaded and they can download stuff. Um, obviously, there's Spotify and so on. I think um, where people have a, a love for music, we just have to keep playing it and exposing it and introducing it to people. Um, what I find amazing, which is kind of a slight a tangent response to your question, but I went to um, the, what do you call it, Somerset House last summer, and there's a guy called Geica, some of you might be might know of him, he's an artist, but he also um, puts on events, and to compliment the up, upcoming carnival, because it was just about before carnival, he put on some events, and there was young people listening to records that were 1977, because I recognised them, and they were reggae, and somehow these people knew the words, like at that event and at some of the other events. So somehow people are tapping into music, whether it's hearing it from their friends or whether it's online and they're downloading it. So somehow it is still getting through, but I, I kind of understand what you're saying in terms of the accessibility having increased, but the, I, mean, I think maybe it's about the mainstream still not recognising, respecting and valuing the music. So stuff is kind of still quite niche. Stuff might get played at one o'clock in the morning on the mainstream um, radio stations or online. But I just think it's people who love the music and who know about it's got to keep plugging away, at exposing it. I mean, I just add to that. I think that part of um, part of the challenge really um, is also about um, having a respect for some of the um, the new music that's been produced by young artists and and have that have young audiences. Um, we have a, I've forgotten her name, Monica, Monique, Monique Charles. Monique Charles, who's a recent um, PhD, um, done a doctorate on grime music, and has done some really interesting work around um, audiences and, um, you know, the artists. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really important that there's a kind of like a respect that's afforded, you know, the, um, the new music and the new audiences for those musics from some of the older kind of practitioners because I think um, people are often too um, quick to dismiss new 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 musical genres because they don't appear to be have the artistry maybe of some of the older forms. Thanks, guys. That was a, a really inspiring uh, talk. I think. The work you do is very important. Thank, um, you. Thank you very much. This, uh, this question uh, kind of comes out of naivety, but um, I'm just kind of curious about in terms of film. Obviously, there's a few um, kind of important uh, filmic um, pieces that show reggae culture, like The Harder They Come and uh, Babylon. Um, and I was just thinking about kind of women's roles in film and reggae culture, mm -hmm. and how in Babylon the kind of women are more just kind of girlfriend characters who aren't very important, and they kind of slow down, um, you know, young Brinsley Ford's kind of spiritual development. 
Um, and I'm just kind of asking, you know, where are the important uh, pieces, or are they there, or are they yet to come? Linda will correct me, my sense is they're yet to come, and I think, um, I hope um, to do a piece of work at Goldsmiths which will look at female in the DJ, in the sound system world, not even the DJ, to make it even more specialist. But I'm hoping as more and more people are getting involved in the practice and more and more people are studying different aspects of music, we'll see some research being done and that might lead to films being made because I've, I've just got the sense that over the last five or more years it's been bubbling and people are being um, the, 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 the debates and discussions are happening and that will lead someone to, to actually do pieces of work but it's not naivety it's, it's the fact that you've picked up on that as back in the sort of you know the 80s and 90s that was the way the roles that women were seeing you know funding um, the, the food or you know purchasing the food selling the drinks being the girlfriends and stuff that that is what, what it was but I, I, maybe as we go forward because we've got a whole band of people now getting more more visibilities it's improving the films and the documentaries and the documentation will start to happen and I think just to add to that I think it's important to note that um not, whilst I'm not an authority I'm I'm aware that in the Jamaican context there is a whole kind of burgeon burgeoning entrepreneurial um kind of wave of um practitioners who including filmmakers, including female filmmakers, who are very keen to have their voice and to, you know, to kind of like just position women differently. Um, alongside that, in terms of um, academic discourse, there's a whole, um, I'm, I'm aware of some research that's looking at the dance hall space and really reassigning the agency of women within that space, that they are not necessarily um, victims, they actually have power within that space. Clearly, you know, it's kind of linked to economic um, power. But, you know, out of that, um, traditionally, um, women DJs can transform from starting out as a performer, but moving on to being a producer, and again, having more control of how women are portrayed. So I'm hopeful that coming out of Jamaica, definitely in terms of creative um, entrepreneurial work, that we'll see more um, positive. Yeah, positive images of women. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Uh, I wanted to ask, like, do you find that the songs that are played on sound systems or that you play on sound systems are generally easy to mix or is, are there elements that make it difficult to blend from one song to another? And kind of what do you lock into when you're, when you're making that transition and what are some, like, some of the techniques that you use? So, um I think for us, it's, it's been really quite an organic process. Apart from, we did a couple of terms at um, Goldsmiths where we did this community radio training. But apart from that, everything that we do is self-taught. In terms of our mixing style, um, it very much depends on the, the venue, the audience. Um, and we will switch from one genre of music into another. And, we, and that we can do because of the knowledge of the music, but also reading the, reading the crowd. Oftentimes, when we originally started playing African music, it'd be in languages that even we didn't understand, but it was about catching the vibe. You know, there's a whole tradition of, for instance, uh, African reggae artists who very much um, were paying homage to those early reggae artists like Bob Marley, The Wailers, um, Jimmy Cliff. So they absolutely caught the vibe. And so people, although they may not understand the music, if we mixed it right, they would just be along with us for the ride. So, I hope I'm answering your question. It's um, technique really is informed by what we're playing and who we're playing to. And the other thing that we, we sort of draw on is, as, as Linda said, we will go from genre to genre to kind of keep it, kind of keep the tempo up. So we might play two or three tracks that are right, roots and culture, going back to Africa, talking about Christopher Columbus and stuff like that. And then we'll switch maybe um, out of that into... Um, it might be some African music. Um, it's really sort of, you know, trying to keep a little, tell a little story, 
um, in, in a set of tracks and then moving on and switching. Then we might go from that into the staple singers into 70s or 80s R well, 70s R and B. Then we'll move again um, into a different aspect of, of reggae. So it's really just trying to do a number of things at any one time in, in, in our selection of, of music. So it might be roots and culture, historical, political, then switching it out, going to take a bit more up-tempo, um, some favourites, James Brown, um, you know, other mm. sort of 80s, 90s stuff, sort of by decades, by sub-genres. So just keeping it kind of flowing and just recreating memories for people as well as playing some more up-tempo stuff like Chronics, like Protégé, like um, Coffee, yeah. The only rule in terms of um, what we play is that it, that it has to be, um, you know, not conscious um, in in the heavy sense, but, you know, like June says, it's telling a, a story that generally when we started out, it was about how we would move a, a, a room of people and, and uplift them at times when, you know, they were really treacherous and really kind of... Um, upsetting things happening. So we'd come out of a you know, a demonstration about the new cross fire, come into a space and leave that feeling uplifted and ready for the battle ahead. So sorry to go off the point, but you know, it was playing at a particular time and responding to a particular need, which drove how we play, how we mixed. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder if, as women being in charge of the sound system, it also brought some consciousness towards the representation of the artists that you were choosing to play. So as like the balance between the gender of the artists, or did you get to think about that? How did you include that or not in the way you would prepare the sets? or? How do, what does your library of songs or albums look like? Yeah. Open question. Yeah. So yeah, gender, very good question. Gender does play a role. So whilst, say for example, I can think of um, playing a set of roots and culture, you know, you have um, people like Rita Marley, you have um, Judy Moat, you have Marcia Griffiths, who were backing um, Bob Marley, but they're individual singers in their own right. So it's important to um, it reflect them and what they're saying, if it might be a conscious set that you're playing, you know, bringing Black Woman by Judy Moat, for example, as well as maybe a, a male artist. So we are very conscious of making sure that whether it's soul or whether it's reggae, um, whether it's lovers, that we're not just playing a whole set of just male artists, we are mixing it up and representing the whole spectrum of that particular genre. And also in terms of female artists, and particularly UK reggae artists, Sometimes they are kind of dismissed as um, being lightweight compared to their mainstream Jamaican c counterparts because, you know, the, with the advent of Lovers Rock, it was always the theme was about love and lost love and recovered love. And But the point of the matter is, and it was pointed out to me by someone who was an exile from South Africa. He was um, exiled. Um, he was a member of the BCM, Black Consciousness Movement, um, Steve Beaker, who was assassinated in 1977, and he came to the UK as, uh, as part of an exile, as an exile. And we worked with him in many different um, locations. I remember him saying to me that the struggle doesn't always have to be serious. You know, there's time for love. There is time for that light-heartedness. And so we purposely played um, UK lovers rock artists because as somebody said in that famous, in the film, The Story of Lovers Rock, even the baddest bad man has time for love. Thank you. Any more questions? But just to add to the questions about our, our, our selection, so our selection will have a range of men and women, and you are, that is a really good point, because it's very easy just to just play what's being played by the main, you know, by the mainstream and, and, and lose track of that there are other voices that need to be played alongside and promoters, as, you know, to give that diversity. And that reflects, um, just to finish the point, um, when we talk about um, artists have dual roles, you know, not just as um, artists, singers, producers, but also they're, you know, freedom fighters. They, you know, they, they, they're in every aspect of the struggle. So we were conscious of 
women who had a, played a real key role in that, like Miriam McCabe um, and Angelique Kujio, whose music, you know, at the time that we were playing, it was at the rise of WOMAD, um, world music, um, and given them a platform because they weren't just brilliant artists, they were, you know, at the forefront of the struggle, you know, with the civil rights movement, with Harry Belafonte, um, sorry for Martin Luther King, but then, you know, moving on to more specific struggles and aligning themselves with, um, as women, but as artists. So it was important that we, when we played, the message was, this is great music, but, you know, recognize these women for their role they're playing. Maybe I'll step in with a question since people have gone a bit quiet. Um, excuse me if I ramble a bit. Um, so I was thinking when you were presenting about, you know, you've got this career that spans 30 plus years and you mentioned the kind of technological changes and how you've adapted and responded to those things and the kind of social cultural changes. And I think it's really important to kind of remember the history and heritage of sound system culture as the space where black people could play music and enjoy music because they weren't allowed to go into clubs and that's and it's been so important as well for um, not only black British music and culture but British music and culture as a whole so Britain is so well known across the world for its um, really vibrant musical scene and a lot of that has come from um, Caribbean migration and the musical cultures which it brought with it um, and we think about um, especially in the past few decades things like rave jungle drum and bass up to garage and two-step and grime and how that's been exported and that's kind of become part of a global conversation um, so there's been so many kind of different things that have spawned it and um, the kind of Caribbean wave of immigration has been so important to those, um, to that heritage. Um, but one of the things that I find I'm curious about because it's less easily documented is how, like culturally and in terms of the dance, the dance cultures or kind of maybe if you can comment at all on any changes in the overall cultures that you've noticed at dance events. Um, or th things that have remained the same that you think are surprising. So, I mean, one thing you mentioned with the gender that people still ask where the DJ is even now, so that doesn't appear to have changed so much, but maybe in terms of the dance styles or any anything kind of that uh, comes along with the culture that people don't talk about as much. I saw a post on Facebook this week, and um, the, the, I think it was a woman that was asking, do young people dance with each other? And it, made, it made me smile, and someone came back and said, of course they do. Um, so I think that's an interesting um, observation. Um, obviously, as an older person, I'm not in the, often in these spaces, but I, you know, um, our generations and the generations just either side of us felt comfortable to, to, to do that. And it's, that, that's a sort of interesting observation to make as to whether that's happening in, in, in younger spaces. No, I think that, no, that, that is true. It's not only in our generation, but in our parents' generation, the whole thing of romantic love and, um, and, and, and couples dancing. You know, the, there was a, always a, when I mentioned before about the codified space, there literally was kind of like a format. And within that format, you had you know, scope to freestyle, but there was definitely a beginning of the dance, we're warming up the dance, you know, you get people, you know, moving, you're taking them on the journey, and at the, the end generally was about the opportunity to um, couple up or to have the opportunity to. Um, and so that was what has been the format. And I remember when they were making um, filmmaker Melanie Shabazz, when he was making the film The Story of Lovers Rock, one of the challenges for the choreographer was finding young people when he was choreographing a piece that you know were comfortable with coming together in that rom in that romantic space because he found that um, this film is maybe five six years old young people at that time maybe in their late teens found it very awkward whereas you know um, that wasn't something that we had experienced you know it was some almost like a, a given at the end of the, the dance you'd have a you know you know a, a dance with someone maybe reluctantly maybe have to make you escape but the, there would be an opportunity you know that's when people take their chance. 
And that's how a lot of relationships got formed. You know, people would meet each other at a club or a party and from then build a relationship which went on to, you know, being, being together. Um, and interestingly, I mean, this is a bit of a side issue, but I've often thought that part of the challenge that we have with um, some of the younger men in our communities is the um, inability to, um, in terms of meaningful relationships and how you treat women and how um, the, the notion of... Um, Communicating ro ro romantic love, or you know, whatever you want to call it, that there is a there is definitely a, a, a an absence of understanding of how you develop meaningful relationships, and that wasn't an issue for us in our day. You know, there was quite a you know, you went to a dance if you wanted to escape, you left early, but if you wanted to take your chance, you'd stay and you know see what could happen, and that was a bona fide way of meeting people and having a romantic no strings attached interchange. There's nothing like that that exists, I don't think. I think the other interesting thing was when we were at the ministry event, there was a young DJ from Bristol there called Adiba. And I think as, um, as time has gone on and there's a recognition of other, um, of creating spaces for a range of people. Mm -hmm. So she talked about safe spaces for women. Uh, where that she part, she's part of a collective um, of women DJs and they look out for other women who can come in and, and feel that they don't, on the conversely to what we were saying earlier, they don't have to dance with anybody. They can just come in, feel free, um, not feel threatened. If someone um, is maybe take, trying to take advantage or trying to harass them, then that's dealt with by the people on the door, dealt with by other women. If a woman wants to go on stage and dance behind the DJs, they can do that. So it's also um, people having safe spaces where they can go out and enjoy music and not feel hindered or hampered or harassed by anybody. Or if that kind of happens, that, that, that it'll, be, it'll be dealt with. So that's kind of another development, which is not my my experience as such because we moved to a different time and in different worlds, different environments. Thank you. That's yeah, that's exactly kind of the sort of thing I'm curious about because people those those stories tend to get lost and um, it's great to rediscover the music but you can't quite rediscover the atmosphere of the dance floors or the practices and um, that's really great. The other thing I wanted to ask you to say a bit more about was the role of pirate radio stations and um, particularly given that nowadays, you know, BBC have kind of have an urban station, they've got Radio 1 Extra and they've got, they've taken that on board, but that wasn't always the case. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about, um, yeah, pirate radio stations. Should I mention? I think that um, it's important to sort of, um, how the, the, t the term pirate radio was created was literally um, a pirate ship, called Radio Car well, Caroline that used to broadcast from somewhere in Luxembourg or off the coast of Luxembourg. And they were the, it was the only station, this is pre-community radio pirate stations, whatever you want to call it, that, that we as black people could listen to music that wasn't your standard BBC fare. And it was such an arduous and depressing process. You literally had to be hanging off you know, I, was, I used to sleep on the top of a bunk bed and I used to have to hang off the bunk bed with my hand out the window with an aerial just to try and catch the signal. I mean, literally, you know, risking life and limb to listen to some decent music. So that was Radio Caroline. Um, and people like John Peel were very influential in, in those days who went on to be one of the stalwarts of BBC Radio. And he was very visionary, being a, a white English man, but very much open to um, giving artists breaks, whether they were... Algerian or um, North North African, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, even you know the South Pacific artists, but just really groundbreaking, pioneering. And used to listen to him on BBC. So this is the the forerunner to some of the black DJs who then kind of like came on the scene, which June's going to mention. Yeah, pirate radio. Although you do have Radio Extra, Radio One Extra. Um, Pirate radio stations, or community radio stations, are still really important to the black community because a lot of the music, um, that, I mean, I still listen to them um, whether it's during the weekday and particularly at the weekends. A lot of the music they play, you do not hear. Mm. Um, occasionally, you might get people like I say, Coffee and Chronics and so on, who've kind of 
broken that mould. They get featured on Radio 1 Extra, etc. But a lot of the older music as well, maybe some of the dancehall music, some of the what we used to call ragga, um, some of the more hard edge reggae music, you don't hear on, the, or hear on those stations. And so, you know, new up and coming artists, the only way they kind of get heard is on the community radio stations. So, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, the role they play is still as integral now as it as, as it was then. You know, Cho- Choice FM, a lot of people might, might know of Choice FM uh, back in the day. They never called themselves a black radio station because they didn't want to, what's the word? They wanted to kind of, mainstream. yeah, go mainstream. So they called themselves urban. Hate that word. You know, call it what it is. You know, it's music of black origin or black music. But, you know, they got taken over, as we know, by uh, Capital Radio. And then one by one, all the DJs that made Choice FM what it was, Daddy Ernie and other DJs are either now on uh, community radio stations or a lot of them went to My Soul, which is a you know d- 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 dab radio station. So um, a lot of yeah mainstream dominates and as I say, the importance of community radio stations, whatever kind of music they're playing, whether it is grime, whether it's um, ragga, whether it's um, old star reggae still having a vital place to, to play. And also a lot of the community events or the nightclub events um, get promoted on those stations. You're not going to hear about those on um, Radio 1 or Capital Radio. And the irony of it is back in the day, it was the majority, well, not dis- not exclusively, but significant amount of black people were on the streets demonstrating for Choice FM and Kiss FM in back in the day because they were both pirate stations or not official, to get licenses. So we w- walked in the rain and demonstrated for hours on end for that privilege, only four years later for it to be, you know, appropriated. So this is kind of the nature of kind of like what, what the community is up against. And the reason why community radios are legitimate because, they, you know, the mainstream does not, um, you know, meet our needs at all. Um, you know, it's just a fact of life. I think what it kind of... It's kind of like the spirit of creativity in a way. What what it does, it just when you're kind of like oppressed, you kind of like the you know that saying about adversity is the mother of invention. You just become more inventive. And I remember when we were on um, Pirate Community Radio, th- there the signal was stronger than LBC and BBC, and you know it was the, 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 from a technical point of view they were on point. They used to you know risk life and limb to put up aerials on high rise blocks of flats, you know, look, keep a lookout for, you know, ETI. yeah, for what they call the beast man, you know, for the, um, you know, be on, be on the lookout. It was, you know, quite a involved and technical um, and very challenging in, in, in the midst of winter, you know, to have people up on, you know, the 20 second story waiting and, you know, signaling, you know, you had to be ready to, to vacate the studio at any, any moment. So these are the kind of the um, challenges that we face and it just makes you, I think, more absolutely more resilient, but there is, there is, that's why the importance, I mean, it wasn't, that film that Spike was introducing about the importance of Tyler Perry's initiative, it kind of is reflective of really where we need to be. We need to be, as different communities, in charge of our own messages, you know, whether it's music, whether it's, you know, whatever kind of sphere we're in, but the importance of, you know, having that control, because we, there's, you know, the other Provision doesn't speak for us, so we have to be inventive. Any final questions before we say thank you? All right, well, thank you so much. That was really fantastic, um, really generous, and so many things for us to think about. So thanks so much for coming. Thank you. And um, once again, we want to thank you because obviously there's other things you could be doing. So thank you for coming and um, staying throughout and for your questions. We really appreciate it. And wish you good luck in all your studies as well.